I'm Dr. Brett DePoyster with the Aquarium Vet, and in this video, we're going to discuss testing ammonia levels and how to interpret the test results. It's important that we conduct regular testing of our aquariums in order to monitor for the presence of ammonia, especially in aquariums that we recently set up or when a whole lot of new fish have just been added to an established aquarium. I recommend that new aquariums should be tested daily until the biofilter is established, which in freshwater tanks generally takes four to eight weeks, while marine aquariums can take even a little bit longer than that. The results should also be recorded and even graphed out to help visualize where in the cycle your biological filter is. Once that biofilter is established, we can cut back on the frequency of testing, let's say to once a week or every other week. Now there are a lot of different ammonia test kits that are available on the market to choose from, and to make things a little bit more complicated, these products use different methods to measure the ammonia, and this needs to be taken into consideration when you're interpreting those test results. I do encourage you to go to your local fish shop and pet store and speak with the staff there to help you pick out a test kit that's appropriate for either your aquarium or for your pond. Now, over the next few minutes, I'm gonna discuss some of the science behind the testing chemistry, which some people might find really interesting, but if chemistry is not your thing, don't worry. I will go through the practical side of interpreting your ammonia tests, along with a few examples later in the lesson. The vast majority of test kits actually measure the total ammonia. And so this includes both the non-toxic ammonium or NH4 and the toxic ammonia or NH3. And as a result, these tests will require a little bit more interpretation of the results in order to calculate the actual amount of toxic ammonia, which is what we're concerned about, that's actually present. And we will cover how exactly to do that in some examples later in this lesson. Depending on the brand of test that you're using, one of two different methods will be used to determine the total ammonia. And these two methods are the Nessler method and the ammonium salicylate method. Both tests are colometric tests, meaning that the concentration of ammonia is actually determined by a color change in the solution. You will then use a reference chart in order to determine the concentration that's there. The Nessler method uses a reagent conveniently called the Nessler reagent, and it binds with the ammonia present in the water to produce a yellow color, and the intensity will darken with the higher concentration of ammonia that might be there. The color reference card supplied with your test kit is then used to determine the concentration of total ammonia that's present. Nessler-based test kits have several disadvantages. The first is that the Nessler reagent contains mercury and care should be taken when handling and disposing of the reagents. I often see hobbyists using their fingers to cover the test tubes while they're mixing the water instead of using the provided caps with the test. And this is not good practice. Not only can it interfere with the test results, but it can also be a potentially dangerous practice as that mercury can be toxic. Another disadvantage is that the Nessler reagent can interact with certain medications in the water and give false readings. For example, many of the commercially available treatments used to treat infections such as white spot disease are generally either formalin-based or copper-based, both of which can bind with the Nessler reagent resulting in a falsely elevated total ammonia reading. Another thing that can inter interfere with the tests are many of the ammonia locking or binding agents that's used in ammonia toxicity. And those binding agents will bind the ammonia, making it not toxic. However, the Nessler reagents will still react with that ammonia complex, again, giving a falsely elevated toxic ammonia reading. The second and most common method of testing ammonia utilizes the ammonia salicylate method. And the advantages over the Nessler method is that there's no mercury-based reagents, so it's safer to use, and also the results are not affected by formalin treatments or the ammonia locking agents. Results from both of those tests give us total ammonia. And now recall, this includes both toxic NH3 and the less toxic ammonium or NH4. And so in order to get a better interpretation of those results, we need to consider two other important water quality parameters that affect that balance of a toxic ammonia and the less toxic ammonium. In freshwater tanks, this includes temperature and the pH. And in marine systems, the salinity must also be considered. So let's walk through a few examples of how to interpret those ammonia test results. 
In the first two examples, we're going to see how different temperatures and pH will have an effect on the amount of toxic ammonia present in freshwater aquariums. As I've mentioned earlier in the lesson, most of the commercial home aquarium ammonia testing kits measure the total ammonia nitrogen, or the TAN, and determine the actual amount of toxic ammonia, or NH3, we need to perform further calculations to determine the actual amount of ammonia that's present. In order to do these calculations, three things are required. The first is the temperature of the aquarium water. The second is the pH of the water. And lastly, a chart to help with the calculations. And this chart typically comes with the ammonia test kit. In both of our examples that we're about to go through, we will have a test result of one meg per mil, or one ppm of total ammonia nitrogen. And in the first example, it's an aquarium with discus, and it's maintained with a temperature of 28 degrees Celsius, or that's 82.4 degrees Fahrenheit, and a pH of 6.6, .6, and as we said, a tan of one meg per mil, or one ppm. This chart is specifically used for freshwater aquariums that has a salinity of zero, and it'll help determine what conversion factor we need to use to determine the amount of ammonia, or an H3, that's present. The first step is to locate the temperature at the top of the chart. And in this example, our discus are maintained at 28 degrees Celsius, which is circled here. Next, locate the pH on the left-hand side of the chart, and in this example is 6.6 .6 and now circled. We then use this conversion factor from where these two data points intersect, which in this example is 0.003. Finally, we will multiply the TAN by this conversion factor to get the total ammonia. So the math is pretty straightforward here, and we'll multiply 1 ppm by the conversion factor of 0.003, which equals 0.003 ppm of NH3. And this is below the toxic level of free ammonia. Now in our second example, the TAN measured is still the same, so we have that one ppm. However, instead of discus, we have African cichlids in this aquarium, which is maintained with a much higher pH of 8.2 and a temperature of 24 degrees Celsius or 75.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Going to the chart again, we first locate the temperature at the top of the chart, followed by the pH to the left of the chart, and then we find that conversion factor where these two parameters intersect. So, in this case, it's 0.077. Finally, we multiply that tan reading of 1 ppm by the conversion factor of 0.077, and we get a reading of 0.077 ppm of ammonia, or NH3, which is toxic to the fish. Now, in these two examples, we can see that despite the same TAN reading, there's quite different percentages of toxic ammonia or NH3 that's present directly due to the effects that that pH and the temperature have on the amount of ammonia or ammonium that's present. Now, in this third example and final example, we're gonna be looking at a marine tank. And here, we actually are gonna be using a different chart to determine the conversion factor. This chart considers the effect of salinity on the percentage of toxic ammonia that is present. And as with our freshwater samples, we still need the pH and the temperature of that aquarium water. The chart used here is designed for an aquarium of full salinity or 35 parts per thousand, which is the same as saying 35 grams of salt per liter. And as with the freshwater examples, locate the temperature at the top of the chart the pH at the left of the chart, and get the conversion factor where these two values intersect. And in this example, it is 0.062. And finally, to calculate the amount of ammonia, or NH3, that's present, multiply the TAN of 1 ppm by the conversion factor of 0.062, which equals 0.062 ppm of ammonia that's present. Now, we can see how the salinity affects the amount of ammonia that is present if we compare our calculations to that African cichlid example. Now, both aquariums had a TAN of 1 ppm, a temperature of 24 degrees Celsius, and a pH of 8.2. The main difference is that salinity of 0 ppt and 35 ppt. And we can see that the freshwater aquarium has a lot more available NH3 that's present compared to the marine aquarium. Recall from the ammonia lesson that this occurs because salinity will cause a shift towards the right of the equilibrium equation towards the ammonium or NH4 molecule being the predominant form. There you have it, a comprehensive review of ammonia testing. The key thing to remember is that ideally we want to achieve an ammonia level of zero, as levels even as low as 0.02 ppm can be toxic to our fish. 
This is such an important factor, and that's why it's so critical that we routinely test the ammonia levels in our tanks and prevent any health impacts that could occur to our fish. These impacts and how to deal with ammonia toxicity will be discussed in future lessons, so I'll see you then.